answer your tennis questions live in the chat. And number two, I want to tell you about my virtual tennis camp I have coming up this March 19th, 12 p.m. New York City time. We're going to go over 13 different topics, serve, return to serve. We're going to talk about forehands, backhands, strategy, everything. Uh, it's for premium members of my website, 2minutetennis.net. So go to 2minutetennis.net to check it out. So let's talk first about some topics on double strategy. So let's say you are playing a typical one-up, one-back versus one-up, one-back strategy. This is what you commonly see. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, 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 what's up, Ruben? Thanks so much for commenting. The more you guys comment, the more people know about this. This is great. So this is the normal way people play doubles. But I can tell you, one-up, one-back is kind of a pretty junky way to play doubles. Hey, what's up, nature? What's up, nature? Nature boy, I like that. I like that, nature boy. That's good. So you're better off, instead of playing one up, one back versus one up, one back, you're better off playing both up if this is your team, or you're actually better playing both back. The one up, one back is great, but really only up against a one up, one back team. And I would even say, <laughs> saying great is a little liberal in the way I described it. You're better off either playing both up or both back. Uh, yo, what's up, Nick? Yo, yo, what is up, Nick? You caught me live here, Nick. Nick's one of my best friends. He is a brilliant. What's up, Nick? What's up? We got Nikki Cool here. Excellent. So Nick Nemiroff, you just saw Nick Nemiroff just comment here. One of my best friends. And uh, Nick, you probably don't even know that we are friends, right? Nicholas. Uh, Nick, I saw your video of you playing that guy in New York City. Uh, good play. That was some good play. So here's the thing. If you want to win more doubles matches, I'm gonna tell you that you gotta figure out how to be in this formation. You gotta figure out how, how to be both up against one up, one back. And the way you're gonna do that is with a serve and volley. Thank you so much. We got 25 people in here, which is incredible, but only five likes. What's up, Karim? Let's, we gotta get more likes. Let's see if we can get to 12 likes in the next 40 seconds. I think we can do it. So here's how you're gonna serve and volley. Now. When people talk about serve and volley, they think of two things, serve and volley. I want you to think of something else, the split step. <laughs> Smash that button. Thank you so much, Nick. So instead of just worrying about the serve and the volley, I want you to think about the split step. I use this analogy all the time. If you don't have mortar, if you don't have mortar, which goes between the bricks when you're building a brick house. If you don't have mortar, then don't build a brick house. The serve and the volley are the bricks. The mortar in between those bricks is the split step. If you don't split step, do not serve and volley. And the reason is because you absolutely need to serve, take one, two, three steps, and then split step to be able to handle your opponent's return of serve. You see this all the time, and Vic Braden called this rushing the net to lose at a faster rate. Like, you're just like, I'm just rushing the net. Because when you run forward, how often do you run forward in doubles and you just watch that ball go over your head? Or the ball comes at you or at your feet, or the ball goes away from you. We've all driven the car. We've all gone too fast around a corner and you take a wide turn. It's It's... You can take a sharper turn if you hit the brakes and slow down a little bit. The split step is part braking mechanism. Look at that. We got to 13 likes. That's awesome. If you're watching this, please hit that like button. Obviously, not everyone has hit that like button, so I would appreciate it so much if you did. When you want to change direction in tennis, the goal is to change direction quickly, and you do so with a split step. So here's my goal for you. I want you to practice, and if you're a coach, please teach this to any fellow coaches, maybe you're a trainer and you train other coaches at your tennis club. Uh, if you're a coach, have your students do this. Practice a serve and take one, two, three steps and then split step. See, you're gonna split step in no man's land because that's the time your opponent is gonna hit that return. Thanks for all the tips. Thank you so much, love your tips. Thanks so much, Janet. I appreciate that. 
So if you play on a tennis court, if you play on a tennis court for uh, like that has the 60 foot lines, the 10 and under lines, then you know there's a line on your tennis court, that blended line that's right here. Well, as soon as you serve, you should just take one, two, three steps and then split step basically on that line. You could say it's one step after that line. That's where you should split step on a serve and volley. Now, let's say the return comes back cross court, which it should in most cases. That is what the returner is gonna do, especially if you're a serve and volleyer. Because if you're a serve and volleyer, that's a real opportunity for the returner to try to get it low to your feet. So let's talk about that. Let's say the ball is low to your feet. If you come in and the ball is hit low to you, good thing you split stepped, good thing you put the mortar between the bricks. Again, if you're building a brick house and you don't have the mortar, you run out of it, you're like, stop guys, we're, we're, everyone go home. We're gonna be home for the day because come back tomorrow when we get more mortar because you cannot build a brick house without the mortar in between. You cannot serve and volley without a split step, which is the mortar, and it connects the serve and the volley, which are the bricks. When you have a ball that comes low to you, good thing you split stepped. Here is where you have to make sure, since you are volleying up, every low volley has to go up. That's the only way it's gonna go over the net. You do not wanna volley up. What's up, Kirk? You do not wanna volley up to the net player. See, the net player should have seen that the ball went low to you. So what should they have done? They should have moved forward. This player should have moved back. The last thing you want to do is pop up a volley that was low to the net player. I mean, you're just going to eat that ball, right? So when you are coming forward or you're at the net and you have a low volley, you want to hit the ball to the person farther from you. So you have a low volley you've got to get that ball cross court. Then you can come forward, this person can come in, this person should move back, and now it is two against one. And these two players are now hoping to pick on this person. Now, this player should hit the ball, preferably down the middle, right? Down the middle solves the riddle, we've all heard that in doubles. And you don't wanna crush that ball. You wanna give gravity and spin a chance to bring that ball down if you're this player. For these two players, they're hoping that doesn't happen. These two players are trying to play the ball above net level and then pick on this player. There's an interesting mindset that is different in singles than in doubles. In singles, it's very much about hitting balls to open court, right? You come into the net and you try to knock off a volley into the open court. But in doubles, You've, in doubles, you've doubled the number of people, two to four, but you haven't doubled the size of the court. And because of that, it's very difficult to keep the ball away from your opponents. Doubles is not about hitting to open space. Doubles is about hitting to the appropriate opponent. And if you cannot end the point, hit it to the person farther from you. And if you can end the point and you can hit it hard, maybe an overhead, you pick on the person closer to you. All right, let's see what we got here. In singles, how far away do you want to stand at the net? Closer to the service line, the middle of the service box, up against the net. I know this will vary, but I'm just asking in general. Mike, that is a fantastic question. So let's talk about this. I've got my singles players right here. Let's remove the doubles players and let's talk some doubles strategy. So, I'm sorry, single strategy. So you get a short ball and you're coming forward, you hit an approach, you're coming in, right? Here's what you have to understand. The farther back your opponent is, the farther back you should be when you're at the net. Let me explain, it's counterintuitive. What people think is, hey, if I hit a nice deep volley and maybe I push my opponent back, then I should really move in. Incorrect. What determines that, Mike, and great question, is what shot is your opponent most likely going to hit? Well, if you push your opponent back, or let's say you're coming in, Mike, you, uh, by the way, Mike, and for all of you watching, do you, do you know the three times? Can I have in the comment section, can somebody try to guess the three times to come to the net? I was gonna tell you the answer, but I'll let you all just kind of decide. Uh, what are the three times in tennis, singles or doubles to come to the net? But let's say your shot 
pushes your opponent back and you start coming forward, you would want to stop on the service line. Because if you get tight to the net, you've pushed them to the fence, they're most likely going to lob. People lob, uh, serve, short ball, in trouble. Very good, Nick. Who's your coach? <laughs> All right. So, yes, serve and volley uh, when you get a short ball and when your opponent's in trouble. Nick, nice job. So when you push your opponent back, back toward the fence, you want to, oops, sorry, man down. You want to only go to the service line. Now, let's say, Mike, based on your question, let's say you hit a volley and you hit it a bit short and your opponent steps inside the court. That's when you want to make sure that you are up. Think about ice hockey. Think about field hockey. Um, think about uh, soccer. Anytime there's a goal, you want to go forward to become bigger and cover more angle. Your opponent, when they are inside the court, they will most likely not lob. And even if they do lob, most players, Mike, have not calibrated the touch of hitting lobs from inside the court. Players are better at lobbing from behind the baseline. It is quite difficult, especially if you're gonna to hit topspin, to hit a lob from no man's land or inside the baseline. There's not a lot of room here. And to get that ball to go up over the net and then or up over the opponent and up, up over you, and then to fall is very tough. So people usually hit ground strokes from inside the baseline. And if they're behind the baseline, especially if they're moving back, they're gonna, then you'd actually wanna hang back because they're most likely gonna lob. So it's a bit counterintuitive on what you're gonna do. Um, if you're looking for a distance, I mean, GVP, it's around six feet, eight feet. So you do wanna get pretty tight to the net if you're suspecting that your opponent is not going to lob. But if they start to lean back, right? If they're like reaching for the ball, you don't wanna get super tight to the net because it's gonna be too easy for that ball to go over you. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. Let's see here. Yeah, you hit a drop shot. That's the same thing as, um, no, serve and volley. Yeah, they're in trouble. You hit a drop shot, and I don't know the last one. So they're in trouble and drop shot are the same thing because you got them in trouble with the drop shot. So serve and volley, your opponent's in trouble. Like you blast an inside out forehand to their backhand and they're just like stretching or you hit a nice high arcing ball and they don't take it on the rise, but they back up to the fence and now the ball's up over their backhand side or whatever. That's when you sneak in uh, short ball, serve and volley. All right, let's see here if we have any more questions. Can you make a series of videos for juniors? I would tell you this, the information that I give is, it, it will help eight-year-olds, it'll help 18-year-olds, it'll help 38-year-olds, it'll help 88-year-olds. So I won't be making a series just for juniors. I've, all the information that I teach here on Two Minute Tennis on YouTube is gonna help all ages. Uh, when hitting forehands in a match, is there a benefit to alternating your forehand finishes or that doesn't matter? Okay, so let me say it a different way. Is there a benefit to hitting the ball lower over the net, higher over the net, shorter in the court, deeper in the court, less spin, more spin? The answer to that question is absolutely. And the way you can do that is with the finishes. See, the finish is just an extension of your, or a, a continuation, I should say, of your follow through. So let's say you're driving the ball. Well, if you're driving the ball, you're not gonna finish up above your head. If you're driving the ball, then the finish is gonna be more here. If you're late and kind of on your back foot, or you're taking the ball on the rise and you're playing the ball like this, or like a, let's say you're running and you wanna hit a cross court passing shot and you gotta do this to get enough spin on the ball. So yes, you should have different finishes, but the purpose of those finishes and the, re and the reason those finishes occur is because the finish is a continuation of the direction you were swinging during contact. So if you're swinging little like, more through the ball than the follow through is gonna be here. But if you're swinging more up, then the follow through is gonna be here and vice versa. Let's see what we got here. In doubles, uh, seem, I do not know what to do when the opponent returned a ball with no pace and both of them move forward to block. Hey buddy, let me see here. You're good dude, uh, to block all my options. Okay, in doubles seems I don't know what to do when the opponent returns a ball with no pace and both of them move forward to block all my options. Okay, so 
let me ask who, let me see who asked that question. Okay, 74. 74, can you give me the definition of a lob? Can you give me the definition of a lob? Because you said they block all your options. So that is, first off, that's not true. You have many options. Uh, so uh, 74, can you type in the, no. Uh, can you type in the, the, the chat here what the definition of a lob is? Buddy, just uh, close the door, please, okay? Yep, thank you. Uh, doubles tennis, partner is serving. How tight do you stand to the net? Square in the middle of the box, like draw an X. Let's see at 74. What is the definition of a lob? And then I will answer your question, 74. What if my opponent knows my one, two, three split step hit in doubles? That that doesn't matter at all. You have you have no choice but to serve in volley with a with a one, two, three split step. Like that would be like saying, what if I'm what if I'm boxing and my opponent knows I'm gonna punch them in the head? <laughs> it's like they know you're gonna punch them in the head. That's the that's in the definition of boxing. You know what I mean? What what if I'm playing American football, go Eagles? What if we're playing a what if what if I'm playing a team and they know I'm gonna pass the ball? It's like you're a quarterback, that's what's gonna happen. Uh to make ball cross the opponent from above. Okay, so that's very interesting. So 74. People typically, in my opinion, have the wrong definition of a lob. What players think a lob is, is a ball that goes over someone's head and lands behind them. That is not the definition of a lob. A lob is simply a high ball. It has nothing to do with the depth, right? So let me explain. When, when you are playing, one of the most value, actually it's the number one most valuable thing you can do on a tennis court is to force an error. So there are three ways that a point ends. You hit a winner, your opponent makes an unforced error. You did like a double fault, like no, uh, no you didn't do anything, they just messed up at a time that, when they really shouldn't. Or a forced error, you actually forced them into an error. You were playing doubles and you crushed a hundred mile an hour overhead right into the chest of your opponent who was, you know, 10 feet from you, they, they couldn't react. That's a forced error. You force them into making an error. The forced error is the most valuable one of those three. What I want you to do when your opponent comes to the net, and in doubles, it's the same thing when your opponents are at the net, I want you to think about lobbing, but not to avoid them. I want you to lob incredibly high. What I recommend is that you get your lob in the air for two and a half seconds at least. I, I love using timers. I think uh, in the last two years, I've kind of become obsessed with timing things, timing the toss, timing how long the back foot comes up for a pinpoint stance, uh, timing the split step based on the contact and when the feet hit the ground. These are really cool things that you can compare pros to, to recreational players and amateurs. One of the things I've started to do most recently is timing lobs. And what I've noticed is that when a pro is in trouble or trying to mess up the opponent, they get the ball in the air for at least two and a half seconds. I saw this at Indian Wells last year. There's a video on YouTube, and I, you know, I'm always watching tennis on YouTube. I watch basically no live tennis, and all the tennis I watch are all YouTube videos. And because I'm trying to look for videos that are, uh, um, uh, good for, you know, making an, an analysis. And there was a uh, Jamie Murray overhead that he butchered. <laughs> I mean, he totally framed it bottom of the net at Indian Wells. And he had lobbed the opponents. They ran back and, he, and the opponent, I forget who it was, he hit this lob way up in the air. And you might think that hitting a lob that's in the air for two and a half seconds is easy. It is not. Most players really struggle getting the ball up into the air for more than two seconds. Um, two seconds is a really long time when you hit a lob and you got to keep the ball in the air before they hit the overhead. It's actually really long. But if you can get it for two and a half seconds up to three seconds, they're going to screw that up. So here's what I want you to do. If you feel like you have no options when your opponents are at the net, guess what? This is you. I want you to lob so high that it lands right on the service line and they will screw up the overhead. They're gonna screw that overhead up 60 to 70% of the time. Now what you've done is you've pushed them back 
And even if they do make that overhead, now you can get it low to them because you push them back. They pop it up, you come in, now you can go down the middle, you can go over here and you can actually win. So instead of thinking that you have to lob over them, I, I really started investigating this a while back because I started noticing that people had the wrong definition of a lob. And thank you so much. We got 20 likes, 29 of you watching. If you haven't hit that like button, I would love it if you did. Um, I, I, I want you to not think that a lob has to avoid the opponent. If you're playing singles, lob over your opponent's backhand side. If you're playing doubles, lob it right down the middle, right? That's why I said right here, lob it directly down the middle. Let them fight over it and mess it up. And what you've done is you've pushed them back. Um, when a ball is dropping from that high, I calculated last week, I was doing a class, and I calculated it just using the 9.8 meters per second per second acceleration due to gravity. Uh, and the ball, if you can keep it in the air for three seconds before it comes down and is hit, uh, it's, tra it's dropping at 32 feet. I'm uh, sorry, 32 miles an hour. It's pretty incredible. 32 miles an hour is how fast it's dropping, and they've got to time that. It's not easy to do. Let's see what other questions we got here. Thanks so much for all the likes. We went from 20... Uh, we went from 20 to 28, like real quick. Been watching your channel for a while. Thanks for all the content. You got it, Billy. Thanks so much. When serving, is it advantageous to always jump a bit off the ground? Does that add speed to the serve? Gerald, great question. Let's, let's talk about the serve and leg drive. First off, as much as Andy Roddick wants to tell you that the legs are the number one power source in the serve, the legs are far from the number one power source in the serve. They, they are not the number one power source in the serve. Um, the number one power source in the serve is your elbow driving forward and up. So let's talk about this. So leg drive only helps your serve. Uh, it helps, but it's not the most important thing. It, you're, you're right, Billy, but it's, it's, it's like the cherry on top of an ice cream sundae. If you don't have the ice cream sundae, it's just a lone cherry and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, okay, it, 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 there's, it's gotta be on something for it to really like be the cherry on top. You know, it's not called the cherry, it's called the cherry on top. So in order for the leg drive to actually work and to actually add anything to your serve, first off, you gotta wear a birthday hat and you wanna learn to make this move, right? So you wanna learn to make this move which is 360 degrees of rotation. You wanna do so with your palm down. Once your palm is up, you cannot make that circle. Once you go across your feet and immediately go like this, this is why the waiter's tray is something you don't want to do. Getting into the waiter's tray, and I'm, I'm gonna to talk to you about the, the leg drive in a second, but I wanna set this up. When you go into the waiter's tray, it causes two problems. One, it gets the racket going flat into the ball. Well, that's a problem because you're not going to be able to spin the ball, nor are you going to be able to pronate, which is a power source and the ability to control and get that ball to curve. But another thing occurs when you just lay the racket back. You're not drawing a circle. Watch this. See this circular movement? Now look how it just lays open. It lays open, and then I go to the ball, and the racket has to reverse course. It actually has to stop to come back to the ball. So all the momentum, it, it's lost, and then it goes to the ball. You want to draw a circular movement like this. Now, the only way to draw this circular movement, watch my elbow. The only way to make that circular movement is to make this movement with the elbow. This is why it's so important that you elbow the enemy. Vic Braden came up with the elbow the enemy 50 years ago. It, it's not a new concept. Elbowing someone behind you is not a new concept. So elbowing someone behind you it lengthens the distance that your elbow has to travel. And somebody right it there, all of you high school kids, <laughs> what is the definition of speed, right? What's the calculation of speed? It is distance over time. So when you have your elbow go back, that lengthens the distance that your elbow has to travel. Distance over time, like miles per hour, right? It's the definition of speed. So when I have my elbow back here, and I need my elbow to come up all the way around to draw this circular swing, I've created a longer distance in a certain amount of time. I would suggest 0 0.6 to 0.9 seconds, which is the ball coming out of your hand. That's the toss timing, I would suggest. And that forces the racket to go really fast. Part of, of power on the serve 
is creating the environment where speed and, and swinging fast actually solves a problem. This isn't golf where the ball is sitting still. In all tennis shots, the ball is moving. So there's timing involved. It's not just what you do, it's when you do it. So if you wanna swing fast on your serve, yet your toss goes to the moon, well, no wonder you gotta pause here or wait here. Like, you, you, you have to time it. So when you actually bring your elbow back and your palm is down, now you can make a circular swing and you're actually using the most important and most powerful uh, you know, technique you can have on the serve. Now, when it comes to leg drive, leg drive isn't just about bending your knees and exploding. You also wanna make sure that you coil because, oh my gosh, oh, Erwin, Chuck, thank you so much. How kind of you to leave a tip. That was so nice of you. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. Thank you. So when you are bending, you don't just want to bend your knees and come up again. You want to coil. So you want to be like a, like a wine opener, like a wine bottle, you know, like a cork opener. You want to be like a corkscrew where you wind down and then wind up again. Now, when you are going down and coming up, it's important that you explode up with your legs or begin exploding up. I'm gonna be very specific with my words. You have to begin exploding up with your legs and pushing off, the, off, the, pushing off against the ground. You have to start that just before or as you're hitting the birthday hat. There is a range of acceptability. So what you wanna do, and it, like Riley Opelka, uh, Nick Kyrgios, Roger Federer, Naomi Osaka, right? They all begin exploding up. Like Riley begins exploding here. Kyrgios begins exploding with his racket here. Federer, uh, JJ Wolf, Naomi Osaka, their racket is above. There's a range here. Roddick was here. So the goal is to make sure first that you are knocking off the birthday hat. And if Roger Federer was wearing a birthday hat, he would knock the birthday hat off every time. Look at Sam Groth, fastest server of all time. His racket, his racket goes like this. I mean, his racket goes right in over the head within an inch or two of his head. I, I'm willing to bet that he has hit his head at some point in his career. What you wanna do is bend and then start exploding up and as you begin exploding up, that's when you're hitting the birthday hat. The reason is this. There's one purpose and one purpose only of the leg drive. It is to get the on the serve. It is to get the body going up as the racket is going down. That produces a stretch in the shoulder. I mean, just think about it. If your body is going up as your racket's going down, they're going in opposite directions. It's like taking a rubber band and stretching it apart. What happens to the rubber band if one end goes this way and the other end goes that way? The middle stretches. Do you know what the middle is? Your shoulder. The body is going up as your racket's going down. So the force of the racket's going down as the body is going up. Your racket weighs something. For me, it's 10.6 ounces. So the racket is going down as my body goes up. That produces a big stretch in the shoulder. And then it's like mashed potatoes at your brother at Thanksgiving dinner. And you're just like, you know, fling, right? It lays back, it's like a catapult, and boom, it snaps up over. So uh, the vast majority of my experience, and I do have experience, I've been teaching tennis for 26 years, uh, the vast majority of recreational players who bend their knees and jump, to answer that original question from 10 minutes ago, they bend the knees and jump way too late. And it's usually because the toss is too high. The toss was so high that the racket kept going, it kept falling, kept falling, and then they explode up, but they explode up while the racket's going up. You want to explode up as the racket's going down, that stretches the shoulder and you gain the benefit. So there, there's a lot of work to do with most students before you can actually uh, get them to worry about their leg drive. In fact, I gave a lesson to a guy in London today uh, on Zoom. I didn't fly to London, nor did he come over here to the United States, uh, but I taught a guy in London and you know, I gave him seven things I wanted to work. I gave him a 50 minute Zoom lesson. If you'd like me to teach you personally, just go to twominutetennis.net and you can sign up. If you become a premium member, then you get a free Zoom lesson, which is normally $130. Premium membership is $40 a month, cancel anytime. 
And uh, he was actually using, because he's a premium member, he was actually using his free Zoom lesson. And he bought two more, but uh, he got, um, he, we were using his free Zoom lesson. And after I was done, he said, Ryan, you didn't talk about my legs. Like, what about my leg drive? And I said, there are, there are some bigger fish to fry uh, before we get to the leg drive. Uh, so we have to make sure of all of this. And I said, how about in a couple months, we'll come back to your serve and then we'll see how it goes and we'll see how all these movements are, uh, are working for you. And then we'll start to add the leg drive. So uh, if you would like me, whoever asked that question, I think, let me see if I can even see uh, who, when you draw the circle, do you begin by throwing the elbow forward? Uh, yes. Thank you, Nikki, with the distance over time. Um, yes, but it's body rotation. So there is this movement but you are rotating the body in order to make that happen, which is so important. You wanna rotate and then bring this arm in so that you stop the body's rotation. And that's what accelerates the racket even more. Uh, uh, on the serve, players don't consciously jump. They push off the ground. The force causes their feet to leave the ground. Okay. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Been watching your channel. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Let me see here. Erwin, thank you very much. I'm seeing that again. I finally caught your live stream. Thanks so much, Erwin. Uh, there was a time with the rules of tennis mandated that the server stay in contact with the ground. You are 100% right. Yep, you're 100% right. When you look at Arthur Ashe, Arthur Ashe came in with his right foot. You know who else came in with the right foot? Boris Becker. Now he jumped, I mean, he had this huge knee bend and leg drive, um, but you know what's so funny? Is he didn't land on his front foot. He actually crossed and scissored. Um, thanks so much. I also got your Tops from Pro with the, uh, <laughs> um, using my link. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, that is Legal Eagle. Yeah, I teach him. I teach Legal Eagle. <laughs> so if he's here, yeah. What are the three most common things that you teach that are wrong? What's up, Legal? What's up, Devin? Uh, because they are directed at the average player and what is the right version? What are the three most common things that you teach that are wrong I don't, I don't understand the question. What are the three most common things that you teach that are wrong because they are directed at the average player and what is the right version? Um, let me, I, are you talking about what are, what are things that I hear? Uh, Devin, is that what you're asking? What are things that most people are taught that are wrong and what is the right version, meaning my version or Vic Braden's version? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying, legal? Here, let me give you one, even if it's not what you're asking. Let me give you one. There is a very specific coach on YouTube who talks about this, like something that you teach that is 100% perfect. Oh, I gotcha, I gotcha, gotcha. Thank, thank you, thank you. So here's, here's one thing that I'll tell you uh, that I hear all the time that is that frustrates me. And it's the, the trophy pose. So the trophy position is so bad for your tennis game. And it's not because, in the serve, it's not because the trophy position is wrong, but by talking about the trophy position, what players end up doing is getting into a false trophy pose. Let me explain. When you watch Federer Let's take J.J. Wolf. Love that guy, sir. Number 44 in the world, 24 years old, just turned 24 a couple months ago. And his serve is insane. What you notice is that on his serve, he doesn't get into this position, hand over the elbow. He gets into this position, hand next to the elbow. So the hand next to the elbow position, this position right here, that position, is the elbow the enemy position. When players get into this position, and you'll see that coach, you'll see that coach on YouTube, put their students and have them practice throwing a ball. And they, he has them put the hand above the elbow and then throw from there. The problem is this is not a power position because the elbow didn't elbow someone first. Now, this isn't surprising because people not from the US or even like you know South America, those players from Europe and you know Asia, what they end up doing is not playing baseball when they're young. 
And so they tend to not have a ton of experience throwing a ball. But I can remember Michael Vick, you know, a well-known quarterback in the, in the U.S. here for the NFL. He had this most beautiful throwing motion, elbow back, elbow forward. So the, the real goal on the serve is not to get into the trophy position as soon as you toss and to get the hand above the elbow. The goal is as you lift to feel like you're keeping the tip of the racket down with a nice, loose, relaxed position and you make this move. Then from here, that elbow's back and then you knock off the birthday hat. So Devin, here's, a, here's a, uh, an easy answer for you. The idea of... Um, hitting flat volleys. So I don't actually want people to put like zero spin on the ball. Most players chop the heck out of their volleys. They put no spin on the ball whatsoever. I'm sorry, they put way too much spin on the ball. So what I often do is ask people on their volleys, if I'm giving them a lesson, like in person, I will often ask them to try to hit the slightest bit of top spin on their volleys. As ridiculous as that is, and as wrong as that, as that is, it helps the student do something. And that is to set their racket lower than they normally do. What you typically see, and you see this with high level college players and the pros are atrocious at this. Sharapova couldn't hit a backhand volley to save her life. Now, I wouldn't win one point against Sharapova. That is relative to like being a world-class athlete. But what ends up happening with the pros is they chop the heck out of the backhand volley. And the racket goes from above their head like this, straight down to the ground. So what I will often ask students to do while I'm feeding them balls is to just hit a couple slight top spin volleys. And what that does is it gets them to set their racket lower than they typically do. When you set the racket lower than you typically do, you have the chance to hit a little bit of backspin, no spin at all, which, I mean, if you have a little bit of backspin, that's not bad at all, uh, or the actual topspin. So in my opinion, the stroke that is the worst in all of tennis is the volley. And it's because the certifications are absolutely horrendous and the USPTA can't, I mean, it's awful. You, PT, awful, LTA, awful, Aussie, it's, it's, all, it's all crap. And they teach this one grip system and that it's, oh, the one grip system because you don't have enough time to change your grip. Anybody who tells you, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, Eric, uh, for the ready position of foreign volley, should you hold the racket in the forehand volley grip or the continental? I would not tell you, uh, volley with your legs, set the racket out in front and move to the ball. I agree, but there's a certain way to do it and a certain timing, which we can talk about. Uh, the... Continental grip, the one grip system, it is this lie that is just handed down from coach to player, coach to player. I'm, I'm currently teaching someone in South Korea and she says, Ryan, she's a, a college student uh, and I teach her Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. And I think it's like 10 o'clock my time or 10, uh, no, it's like eight o'clock her time at night and it's 6 a.m. for me on Sunday mornings. And she says, Ryan, my volleys are so much better when I change the grip slightly, the way you taught me. But my coach yells at me. But then when I hit my backhand volley, I can't volley to save my life. With a, and she's not a super high level of play. She's learning and she's getting better and she's played tennis for a few years, but she's really struggling with her backhand volley. She, she's, she hates the one grip system. But the coach, nope, it's gotta be the one grip. It's gotta be one grip. And it's the idea that you don't have enough time to change the grips. And so I teach the, the two grip system and because you, you have plenty of time to change your grip. Uh, but th I would say that's the absolute uh, number one tip that I can give people on their volleys is actually try to put the tiniest bit of top spin on your volleys. Not because, of that, not because that's right, but you're training yourself to set the racket lower than you normally do because when you set the racket way above, you'll chop down. Here's another thing, Devin. If you're still on, you can say hi if you are. When the racket comes around, what most players do, and guys, I got about five minutes left and I got to get going. Uh, one grip for volleys is wrong. You need to turn the grip to bevel one or bevel eight for the right hand. Da, 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 da. All right. So here's, here's one thing. 
On the serve, it is so common that players let the racket open. Thank you so much, Devin. So when the racket is open like this, what I teach people is to use the wrong side of the racket. So for any of you who are watching, if you're a coach, if, you're a, uh, if you train coaches, if you're a player struggling with a waiter's tray serve, if you're a parent and you're looking at your kid and they're like this, here's what I want you to do. Thanks so much, Sean. I appreciate it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to knock off the birthday hat and I want you to knock off the birthday hat and I want you to use the wrong side of the racket to hit the ball. Here's why. If you look at Felix Auger Aliassime, if you look at Isner, when they go up to hit the serve, as they drive their elbow up, they get their elbow higher than their hand. What you'll notice is that their strings are facing down at about 45 degrees. It's an incredibly like supinated position. And when you're supinated, it's gonna uh, require pronation. And if you've ever like slammed your hand in a drawer or like in a car door, you're like, oh, and you make this move. That's pronation. You, you don't go like this. You don't go, ow, I hurt my hand. <laughs> Some of you are like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing that with your hand? Like, stop it. It looks weird, right? But if you go like this, it's not so weird because you're making this move. That's the fastest way to move your hand. And that's what you want to do when you're throwing a football, when you're throwing a baseball. Volleyball. Watch volleyball spikes. Volleyball spikes don't look like this. Watch a volleyball spike from a cherry picker, an aerial view, for, like straight down, you'll watch their hand make that move on the volleyball spike. That move is the fastest way to move the racket through contact. Well, you can't do it if you're waiter's tray, and we already talked about the problem with the, you know, the waiter's tray. It's, not a, it's a straight line, not a circular, and you can't pronate. So when you watch Felix and his racket is closed at 45 degrees, what you can do is actually practice using the wrong side of the racket. So you knock off the birthday hat and use the wrong side. And what it teaches you is how to get into this position. If you look at Isner, if you look at Felix, and like all players, but I'm just saying those two because I have videos of them and I can show people. When you're in this position, you can either pronate to contact or you can stay in that position. Now, of course, you don't want to stay like this. That would be, as Devin asked, that would be wrong to do. But what it does is it forces the student to not go into the waiter's tray. I noticed early on in my teaching that if I asked the student to do something wrong and I gave them permission to do something wrong, they had an easier time doing the task. It's like they had really low expectations, so they were like, oh, I'm going to miss, so now I'll actually do it. And so this is one of those. If you ask people to use the wrong side of the racket, they'll go palm down. They'll come around supinated, and then what you have done is you've trained them to know what that feels like finally. Because if you tell people to do this, yet you're telling them to use the correct side of the strings, they have no chance of getting into this position. So you have, because their brain is going to override that and go into the waiter's tray, which is what everyone does, even though everyone knows to be like this. So when you get them into this position, use the back side of the strings, they get to feel what that's like. And then over time, they get to turn and hit the edge. And then over time, they get to turn even later and body emotion tends to stay in motion. The pronation continues. Uh, here is, I was just thinking about my last one. Um, I'll think about it in a second. I, I actually just now, I, I thought of something, but I forget what the, what the third one would be. The uh, reason why I asked my question is because continental is between the forehand and backhand volley grip. Yes, 100% right. Yes, don't wait in the continental. Wait in the forehand grip, and then you can move slightly over. Right? Like, as I taught you, Eric, you can be slightly to one side or slightly on the other. Don't be in a continental. The reason I want you to wait in a continental, I'm sorry, wait, the reason I want you to wait in the forehand volley grip, which is to the side of a continental, is because you can hit a forehand or a backhand with that grip. If you have the time, which is 95% of the time, you can change the grip to the backhand grip and make that move. Darn it, I forget what the, uh, what the third idea was. I, it was really good. I was thinking about it during the serve, but it just left my brain. I'll think about it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I didn't learn volleys until probably six years after I started, and, I, and now I don't uh, like going to the net because I'm uncomfortable, comparatively speaking. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean... I would say that, you know, tennis, it's not a bad idea to kind of start 
from the net and work back rather than working from the baseline and in. And Fan is going, ah, I think there was like a light bulb moment there. I'm just reading here. I have a hard time keeping a fluid uh, movement while hitting a kick serve. I feel like my elbow moving forward conflicts with wanting to stay sideways because I'm being pulled into the court. Any tips? Yes, don't, don't take your elbow forward. You're 100% right. You're conflicted. You're like, wait, I have to bring my elbow forward, but I have to keep my body to the side. Do not bring your elbow forward. I want you to drop the racket down and then just go up again. <laughs> drop the racket down and then go up again. The feeling on a kick serve, it's not 100% right, but the feeling needs to be that the racket goes down and back up in the same path. The racket goes down and back up in the same path. What you do not want is to drive your elbow forward and up because the racket's gonna get thrown off to the right. That's that Vic Braden, don't scratch your back, scratch a friend's back. It's like there's, a, there's someone next to you and you're gonna scratch their back and then hit the ball. You don't want the racket flying out to the outside of your hand like you see with Isner when he's crushing a first serve. When you're hitting a kick serve, top some serve, you're trying to bring that racket down and then back up again, basically in the same path. It's not what happens, but that's the feeling that you're gonna have. You're, Christopher, you're 100% right. Most players do not practice the volley. They just practice uh, from the baseline. Thank you guys so much. Hey, real quick, you know, I've been on here for 45 minutes. If you could just give me 45 seconds, it would mean the world to me. As you know, uh, I run twominutetennis.net. It is my baby, right? It is my, my business. Uh, I have a premium membership. Uh, it's $40 a month. By the way, you'll always notice I start with the price first. I always start with the price because how can you make sense of the value proposition if I don't start with the price? So it's $40 a month, cancel any time. Here's what you get. First, you instantly get a Zoom private lesson with me. This is where you and I meet live on Zoom and you send me videos of your serve, your forehand, your backhand, your match play, your footwork, your, your volleys. You know, we're talking about volleys. And I'm going to put you side by side with the pros. Just today, I taught someone in London and we worked on his serve. I put his serve next to JJ Wolf. I bet put his serve against Ben Shelton. I put his serve against Paolo Badosa, uh, Feder, and myself. You know, you know, the standard was a little lower once I put my, him next to me. But uh, you get, a, and that's usually $130. You get a credit for one of those the moment you sign up, which is awesome. You get a weekly group Zoom class with me. It's on Wednesday nights. 9 p.m. New York City time, super fun. The class keeps growing and growing, super interactive, question and Q&A at the very end. You get my mastery courses, master your serve, master your forehand, master your double strategy. Uh, and of course, with those Wednesday classes, you get uh, the recording if you can't make it. And you also get 50% discount. So any future Zoom or uh, stroke analysis, thank you, Nikki, thank you so much, because I know you were in that class last week. Nikki's one of my premium members uh, on my website. But here's another thing, and Nick, hopefully you can make it this week. This Saturday, I am holding a two-minute tennis virtual tennis camp. I'm gonna be covering in two hours, 13 different topics, giving you two world-class tips in each idea. You ready for them? Serve, topspin forehand, one-handed topspin backhand, two-handed topspin backhand, the slice backhand, forehand volley, one-handed backhand volley, two-handed backhand volley, overhead, footwork, single strategy, double strategy, and mental toughness. I'm going to give you two world-class tips in each one. And that's part of the premium membership of Two Minute Tennis. If you are not a premium member of Two Minute Tennis, I would highly recommend that you check it out and see if it's something that you would like to support me on and also the benefit that you gain and how much you're going to improve. Uh, it's going to, it's, the, the track record speaks for, speaks for itself and uh, the, the students who I've coached and the improvement that they are seeing in their game, is, it's pretty awesome to see. But again, uh, check it out. Go to twominutetennis.net, check out the premium membership and see if it's something that is uh, right for you. So I got to get going. Uh, what is this? Uh, when is this? It's Saturday, nine o'clock for you, uh, Nikki. It's Saturday, 9 a.m. But don't worry, uh, you're already a member. You don't have to do anything. It's free for you. And really, it's, it's, it's included in the membership. Um, and uh, if you can't make it, no problem. It'll be 
Put, yeah, 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 you got it. It'll be with the other uh, recordings for all the premium members of all the Wednesday classes. It'll be right there uh, as, you know, part of those videos. So thank you all so much. If you have any questions, just reach out to me. Go on twominutetennis.net, create an account, and you can talk to me. I have an inbox uh, and I've like kind of like a portal where I can talk to people in there. Uh, but you can also send me an email, ryan at twominutetennis.net, if you have any questions. Uh, if you would like me to personally work with you, match play, footwork, single strategy, double strategy, dude, you got to charge more. Legal Eagle, I, co I completely agree. I completely agree with you. I just noticed that uh, fast nickels beat slow dimes. That is, uh, you know, trust me, it's growing extremely fast uh, because of that. So, uh, but if you'd like to meet, and Legal Eagle's so nice. I've been working with, with Devin for, I don't know, uh, maybe a year and a half now. I think it was summer of 2021 when I started working with him. Uh, hell of a player, really good tennis player. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think some of the things we've worked on with his tennis game have absolutely helped him improve his game too. So really, really a great guy. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Any questions, just let me know. <laughs> Super good looking too. Thank you. I appreciate that, Devin. I didn't know you thought that about me. Thank you. So oh, you were talking about yourself. I didn't realize. I, I, it didn't dawn on me. I wouldn't have thought that, you know, when I looked at you. So uh, thank you all so much, guys. And you got this.